In the past, people believed that everything was made of earth, wind, fire and water. If we were to read an ancient Greek book and see these four items written down together, we would instinctively know what was being referred to. Even if the text didn't go into detail, we'd know that it was referring to the commonly held misconception that there were only four chemical elements. During Muhammad's lifetime, the 7th century, people believed that the Earth was the centre of the universe. They thought not only that the Moon orbited the Earth, but also the Sun and all of the stars. They believed that the orbit of the Sun around the Earth brought the day and the night. If the Quran was written by God, an all-knowing being incapable of error, then it would either not mention anything about the Earth orbiting the Sun, or it would clearly point out that the commonly held belief of the time was incorrect. What it would not do is to reinforce that misconception by commonly grouping the day or night with the course of the sun. If however the Quran was written by a 7th century human, this illogical grouping is exactly what we would expect to see. Here is a list of seven places in the Quran which illogically group these three things. Use the pause button if you wish to read them. It is pretty evident that, as with my example of the four elements, the author of the Quran grouped these items because they believed there was a link between the orbit of the sun and the passing of days. This would only be possible if the sun orbited the earth. In a geocentric universe, the sun and moon look as though they are on the same path, where one could follow the other. But in real life this is not the case. Does perhaps this verse mean instead that the moon rises after the sun? Considering the moon often appears in the sky before the sun rises, the answer is obviously no. It says the moon follows the sun, and to follow something you must be on the same path. This says that both the sun and moon have been subjugated to be of service. It also says that both run for an appointed term. The appointed term for the moon is obvious. It is the amount of time it takes to orbit the earth, as stated in Surah 10, verse number 5. But what is the appointed term of the sun? And in what way is it of any relevance to humanity that God would feel the need to mention it? The sun orbits around the Milky Way galaxy. This orbit, known as a galactic year, takes approximately 225 million years. Obviously this orbit is of no relevance to mankind as a species, let alone an individual's lifetime. However, saying that the sun has been subjugated and, like the moon, runs for an appointed time, makes perfect sense if you believe the sun orbits the earth every 24 hours to bring the daytime. Here is a part of the Quran which says that the sun runs to a resting place. Note that in reality there is no place where the sun rests. The Quran describing the arrival of night and then immediately stating that the sun runs to a resting place is a clear example of how the author of the Quran believed the course of the sun was linked to the night. Just like in ancient Egyptian geocentric mythology where in a constant battle between night and day the sun would go to its resting place each night. Note also there is no ultimate resting place for the sun. Eventually the sun will die it will not rest. In Sahih Muslim, there is a hadith where Muhammad explains how each day the sun goes to a resting place beneath Allah's throne, before being given permission to rise again the next day. Is there more evidence that the author of the Quran believed the sun and moon were in the same orbit? What about this description of the end of the universe? The sun and the moon being gathered together is believed to have been so significant that it would be the end of Allah's creation. In real life we know that this is merely a solar eclipse and that the moon is millions of miles away from the sun. But in the 7th century you would have believed that the sun and moon were the same distance away from the earth and the same size. So an eclipse would look as though the sun and the moon were going to crash into each other an event perceivably so massive that it would cause an end to everything. This verse talks about the end of the universe in a past tense, but obviously the universe didn't end. This verse talks retrospectively about a universe ending event in which the moon split open. 
Obviously, this was a very local event, considering not a single historian in the world at the time recorded it. As the moon passes in front of the sun during an annular eclipse, you can no longer see the moon itself, just its silhouette. As the moon breaks the eclipse, you can no longer see the entire shape of the moon. This results in an optical illusion which could easily be misconstrued as the shape of the moon splitting open. But did Muhammad really believe that not only was it possible for the moon to crash into the sun, but also that a solar eclipse was the end of the world? According to the NASA website, there was a 0.934 magnitude eclipse in Mecca on July 23rd, 6.13 CE, lasting just under two and a half hours. The surahs in the Quran are not written down in the order that Muhammad spoke them. The surah which describes the end of the universe in a past tense, Surah 54, appears to have been approximately the 37th surah spoken by Muhammad when placed in chronological order. Muhammad's religious career started in 610 CE, so the probability that Muhammad spoke the 37th surah, Surah 54, after the solar eclipse on July 23rd, 613 CE, is high. Further investigation reveals the following accounts of Muhammad's reaction to this solar eclipse. First, a hint that Muhammad thought he knew something about solar eclipses which should scare everyone. Next, there is more than just a hint. Muhammad wept and pleaded with Allah not to end the universe. When the eclipse was over, he told the people that he wept during the eclipse because he knew how the universe would end is further corroborated by the following account. Islamic apologists often claim that the Quran explains that the sun and moon are not in the same orbit in the following verse. It is not for the sun to overtake the moon. I could say the same thing for a greyhound chasing after an artificial hare at a racetrack. The dog cannot overtake the hare. But that is because the artificial hare travels faster than the dog and not because they are on different courses. If Allah was telling us something, then why not just say the sun and the earth which orbits it? Also, it is worth noting that due to the parallax effect of the sun being further away than the moon, during a solar eclipse you get the illusion that the moon is travelling faster than the sun therefore making it look as though the sun could not overtake the moon. Hopefully, I've demonstrated to you how the Quran describes a geocentric universe, one in which the orbit of the sun takes 24 hours and is linked to the coming and going of days, one in which the moon follows the sun, one in which the sun rests every 24 hours in order to bring the night, and one in which the sun and moon's orbits are on the same path as to cause them one day to collide. Muhammad clearly believed that a solar eclipse would one day cause the end of the universe, which he thought meant that the moon was crashing into the sun, and that the famous splitting of the moon was merely a solar eclipse which terrified him. The Quran groups the day and night to the course of the sun in multiple places. Just like the grouping of earth, wind, fire and water, it is obvious that the course of the sun is grouped with the day and night due to its author believing a misconception that was common at the time. The misconception that the sun orbited the earth. Whoever authored the Quran incorrectly believed in a geocentric universe. The author was a fallible human who had no more access to information about the universe than his peers. Therefore, the Quran could not have been authored by an all-knowing being that does not make mistakes.